and welcome to The Spin Room. I'm Elon Levy. Today we're joined from our New York studios by Director Emeritus of the Anti-Defamation League, Abe Foxman. Sir, thank you very much for joining us. Here in the studio we have journalists Ruthie Bloom and Nechama Dweck. And today on the agenda, President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Coming up second, we're going to be discussing anti-Semitism in the United States, what's changed since Trump's inauguration. And third, we'll be looking at the widening gulf between American and Israeli Jewry. Well, last week, President Trump made history by becoming the first U.S. president to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. He signed the waiver delaying the move of the U.S. embassy there, but ordered diplomats to start preparing. It's a move that sparked opposition not only from the international community, but many in the Jewish community. We have Ruthie Bloom, Nahama Duak, but first let's go to Abe Foxman in New York. Mr. Foxman, your reaction to President Trump's announcement recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital? I think for most of us in the Jewish community, supporters of Israel, those who care, um, I think we welcomed it. It was a statement of fact, a statement of reality, recognizing that which most of us knew and understood. Um, so uh, from that perspective, it, it was a welcome move. I mean, you say most of us in the Jewish community support the move, but notably the reform movement did come out saying, while well, we agree the embassy should move to Jerusalem, we can't support the president's decision. Did they make a mistake? Well, who am I to say they made a mistake? This is, we're in a democracy. I think there are other issues playing um, from the reform movement, some political issues. Um, so they're entitled to their opinion. I don't think the president made a mistake. I think it exposed the hypocrisy. It exposed um, the reality and the sadness of the status, if you will, of the peace process, if it in fact exists. Um, but, sir, do you think look, it was a mistake for the, the reform president movement, was, which says that it supports moving the embassy to Jerusalem, saying that it doesn't support it when the president does so? Do you think that they should, if they believe that the embassy should be moved, join a united uh, front of the Jewish community? I would have liked to see them support it. I wouldn't call it a mistake. They're entitled to their point of view. But I, I think from the perspective, from the more global perspective, it, it illustrates something very, very, very serious. And that is, all the president did was state a fact. He didn't change anything on the ground. In fact, the United States procedures on American citizens in Jerusalem and Israel, nothing has really changed. And, and Despite that, you have violence, you have the most irrational rhetoric coming out of the Arab world, calling for the de-recognition of Israel. And I, in, in a way, I think the president's position and action exposed how far away we are from peace. Okay, let's bring this discussion into the yeah. studio. Nahama, your thoughts? Mr. Foxman, I would like to know, do you have any idea why didn't, didn't it happen until now? What, what they were afraid of, the previous presidents of the USA? There was blackmail, there were threats, they were afraid of violence, uh, violence which we saw. Um, <clears throat> that's what they were afraid of. I think we, as American Jewish community, we as Israel, I think made a mistake throughout the years. We should have had campaigns to have Jerusalem recognized. After all, we were talking for many, many years about West Jerusalem. So why Israel's, didn't you? Um, Knesset, Israel's, uh, <clears throat> I, it's, well, that's Muhammad, a good question. Muhammad, I don't respect, know why we uh, didn't. Uh, Mr. Mr. Foxman is not a spokesman for the American government, but I'd like to understand very briefly from you, no, Ruthie Bloom. for Blue, the American you, jury. For the American jury, perhaps. Um, well, not, not anymore. Uh, Ruthie, briefly from you, do you think the reform movement made a mistake at the time that Israel was receiving so much pressure over the Jerusalem recognition to say it couldn't support the president's move? It wasn't a mistake. It was a political move. The reform movement in the United States hates Donald Trump. The reform movement has very many anti-Israel elements that they claim are pro-Israel, but they're not actually pro-Israel. And I couldn't agree more with Mr. Well, let's Foxman. go later into that discussion whether they're pro-Israel. We have to go for a very short break. We are going to be back in just a minute. Don't go away. 
Americans have simply lost trust in news media. What happened to the news? All I get is a daily service hey, lies. Do your job and just tell me. I'm overloaded with news that is useless. Give me the facts. Let me sort it. Where's the integrity? Why is the news so bad? I will never trust the media. Unflinching, opinionated. Weeknights, David Schuster and Shayna Estulin bring you analysis, interviews, and opinions that connect us to the Middle East and the world. Watch Crossroads weeknights starting at 6 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Welcome back to The Spin Room. In the last section, we were looking at President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, a decision by a president who has been under much controversy for his attitude towards various racial groups in the United States. We're joined from the United States in our New York studios by Abe Foxman, formerly of the Anti-Defamation League in the studio, Ruthie Bloom and Nahama Duek. And Mr. Foxman, I want to start with you. This time last year, you said, speaking of anti-Semitism in the U.S., the sewer covers are off, but you said you were optimistic about Donald Trump. Trump. Are you still optimistic? Yes, I am uh, by nature an optimist. Uh, I think that it is within the power of the president. He has a bully pulpit, and I'm still optimistic that he will use that pulpit uh, to put back the covers uh, on bigotry, on prejudice, and anti Semitism. So uh, I hope in a moment will come where he will find the language to say that there are no good Nazis and he doesn't want their support. Mr. Foxman, this is a president who caused an international incident with Britain by retweeting far-right racist propaganda, who said there were many fine people on the white uh, supremacist march in uh, Charlottesville. Uh, is this more bully than bully pulpit? Um, I don't think he personally is a bigot. I don't think he's a racist. I don't think he's an anti-Semite. I think you can call him all kinds of things. Um, I think he acts out of impulse, he acts out of peeve, he acts out of anger. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize him as a bigot or an anti-Semite. I think that the, what you've characterized, we've expressed ourselves against. I think it's wrong. There are mistakes. But I'm not ready to write him off uh, that um, he will not find the opportunity to say the right things at the right moment. Uh, Ruth, I'm Bloom, still an we heard here from uh, Mr. Foxman. He's still optimistic that President Trump could put the cover back on the sewer. Are you? I am, but I would like to add uh, something to this discussion, and that has to do with left-wing anti-Semitism and not right-wing white supremacy. Oh, well, firstly, right, let's deal with the question of President Trump, and we'll get on well, to left-wing anti-Semitism. Well, it's connected because President Trump, I don't believe that President Trump unleashed uh, the anti-Semitism from the neo-Nazi, the fringe neo-Nazi groups in America, I might, might add. I think what unleashed it was the much more mainstream and widespread anti-Semitism emanating from groups like Black Lives Matter on college campuses. And that Donald Trump... Could you elaborate what allowed, you mean by that, please? I mean that there have been, there's much more mainstream activity on campuses, for example, across the United States that is an outright anti-Semitic and um, that, is f a, it, that is mainstream, unlike the neo-Nazis, who are really a fringe group in America. Nahama, do you think President Trump is emboldened anti-Semites? No, I'm worried. I don't think that he can put the lead back on the sewer because, you know, we heard just today that since his declaration of recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of, of Israel, the episodes of anti-Semitic all in the U.S. and in the world, Sweden, for instance, went up, you know, and this is very worrying for me. So, you know, we don't know what's happening. They don't like us. And this declaration just added a little bit more salt to the whole. Okay, well, let's, let's, I want, I want to take a look in the time we have on the U.S. arena. We want to show you a clip. It's from Israel's public broadcaster, Khan. It shows a tactical training academy in Pennsylvania, America, which is teaching American Jews to use guns in case they need to defend themselves. Uh, well, let's take a look at this clip. It's been my dream to start an Israeli tactical training school here. I would have done it in Israel if I could, but it's not legal to do this in Israel. 
I want to have Jews armed in their synagogues and trained so that if they see a terrorist or an anti-Semite rocking in with a weapon, they'll know how to neutralize that threat. Mr. Foxman, this gentleman says that 90% of his clients are Orthodox Jews from New York. Should Jews in America be learning to arm themselves to protect schools and synagogues? Uh, the answer is, I think we should be aware, we should be vigilant, I don't think we should arm ourselves. But for a moment, I want to go back to the previous uh, conversation. I, uh, to say, uh, the pre I think the president and the election emboldened bigots and anti-Semites. They didn't create them. And even to link what's happening in Sweden and what's happening in Europe, we've had the same anti-Semitic outbursts, the last conflict that Israel faced in the Middle East. There was anti-Semitism out there. There's anti-Semitism. There has been anti-Semitism in the U.S. There is. Uh, we have put the cover on, the cover is off. So I, to put the blame on this election on the president, I think, is an exaggeration, although the president had broken taboos, taboos in our country on things which were not acceptable, socially not acceptable, morally not acceptable. And again, I still think there's, there's an opportunity for him to reverse it. Now, Jews arming themselves, um, you know, if you lose faith, in your government, if you lose faith in your law enforcement, then you better arm yourself. I don't think there's reason in this country to not have faith, not to have um, um, respect for law enforcement and the defense of our community and other communities. Uh, look, again, and Mr. Fox, when you say that President Trump has an opportunity train, you can, you to put the cover to... back on the lid, you say he has an opportunity to put the cover back on the lid, but that's very different from saying you should be optimistic. Why? What are the grounds for your optimism that President Trump is going to stop emboldening white supremacists in America? Well, because I'm optimistic about America. We saw a minor miracle, miracle happen yesterday. Um, the rationale, reason, morality triumph in the United States and an election in Alabama. We were, you know, so a lot of people prophesized uh, that, uh, you know, the, the wrong people will, uh, you know, the, the bigoted people will win. They didn't. I have faith in America's institutions. I have faith in American people. I have faith in our law enforcement. Um, okay, well, let's bring some this, of the let's bring this some conversation of the into the studio, Mr. Fox. I want to hear whether, do our guests uh, have confidence I in America? It's a very naive point of view. You know, I don't want to compare it to the time of the Nazis. You know, when the Jews in, in Germany, in Austria said, it's nothing, they, you know, they don't like us, but we'll be okay. I don't think it's the same thing. Do you but think the still, situation in America no, 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 is like is the not, situation back then? No, I said, I'm not comparing it. But yet, this is a very, Mr. Foxman point of view is very naive. We can deal with it, you know, it's not so bad, you know, it, it, the president is okay, the, the American jury is going to be all right, we're very strong. We have to look reality in, straight in the eyes and figure out the way to deal with it. Ruthie? I agree that we have to look reality in the eye, and the reality is that Islamist anti-Semitism is a far greater problem than white supremacy it's not in the United Islamic. States it is and not. certainly in That's Europe. That's the point. Not only. It is not. It is fringe. Islamist so anti-Semitism no, is not far because you see it problem. all over the, you know, not all over, but you see groups in America, you see groups that are not Islamic. As I said, in Sweden, in Germany, in Turkey, wherever you look, you see like uh, islands of anti-Semitic all over the world. We have to be alarmed. We have to figure we out the way how to deal with it. Let's take a listen to Mr. Foxman. We have never eliminated anti-Semitism. That's good. We have not found a vaccine or an antidote. We have kept the lid on it. We have kept, uh, you know, as I've said to Seward, the covers, we have kept a lid on it. In Europe, there's legislation. It doesn't totally work. In the United States, there's social pressure. And the, and the um, lid so you I, say I don't is think off I'm, an, I'm, a, in the United I'm a cockeyed it's optimist. The, the I've lid, spent the my adult life fighting anti-Semitism and prejudice. In the United States, but I want to ask you briefly a question about fighting anti-Semitism. Uh, last summer, uh, when Richard Spencer, the white supremacist, was punched in the face, there was a debate in America about whether people should punch Nazis. Or should people punch Nazis? We'll hear your answer after the break. We have to go for a very <laughs> short break right now. We'll let Mr. Foxman think about that. We're going to be back just after the break to discuss anti Semitism in the US and the widening gulf between American Jewry and Israelis. We'll be back after the break.
Our world is becoming increasingly connected. 6.5 million Wi-Fi enabled devices are now shipping every day. And global consumer internet traffic is growing exponentially with 2.8 billion internet users consuming video at a breathtaking rate. We are creating personalized mobile entertainment and communications breakthroughs that are connecting millions of people and billions of devices around the globe. We are Eris and we're powering your digital world. Fearless, timely, and always engaging. Every night, David Schuster brings the news from around the world to your front door. Watch Stateside, weeknights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. News 24 is a Spanish language weekly news magazine on I-24 News, presented by respected journalists Carlos Gurovich and Damian Pachter. Bringing you news and analysis of the most important issues of the Middle East and Israel, with the added perspective of the impact on the Spanish-speaking world. News 24, Fridays only on I-24 News. In the Holy Land, there are wonders most people never get to see. I-24 News will take you inside the shadows and unravel the secrets of some of the world's most revered sites in a way you've never experienced. All access from every angle. Tune in to Sacred Sites 360, Sunday, 9 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Welcome back to The Spin Room. Before the break, we were discussing anti-Semitism in the United States. We're joined by former ADL director Abe Foxman. Uh, Mr. Foxman, back to our previous question. Before, uh, in the summer, when white supremacist Richard Spencer was punched in the face, there was a debate in the United States. Is it okay to punch Nazis? Should people punch Nazis? Uh, very honestly, I never heard that debate. This is the first time I hear about this debate. If somebody comes and threatens you, yeah, you should fight. Otherwise, I would leave it to law enforcement, to the government. It's still, we're still in a society where um, institutions, Jewish institutions, religious institutions, Muslim institutions are protected by a law enforcement. I don't think we've come to the point where everybody should take uh, law into his own hands and decide who he punches and whose views he doesn't like and then begin melee. Oh, okay, so Mr. Think, Foxman. With saying, all due respect, I haven't heard about it till this moment. Mr. Foxman saying, don't take the law into your own hands. Let's move on to the next subject. Uh, Israel and diaspora jury are at a crisis point. In Israel, a right-wing government that has all but handed control of religion and state issues to the ultra-Orthodox, and in the US, a community that is culturally and socio-economically more distant than ever from modern Israeliness. Uh, Mr. Foxman, it's often claimed that US and Israeli Jews are drifting apart. Who's responsible for this gulf? I think ignorance is somewhat responsible. Some of the actions that uh, the recent Israeli government has taken on issues of religious pluralism uh, is adding to this gulf. But primarily, I think we've, throughout the years, we've either dealt in crises of support or we've talked past each other. Um, I, I, what I fail to understand is while the issue of religious tolerance, religious pluralism, it is important for the Israelis why the Israelis themselves don't care enough um, to, to fight for the pluralism. And I think that impacts. I have always said that issues of pluralism are more significant in the relationship than are issues of settlements or occupation. I think on this issue, American Jews on the whole um, will stand aside and let Israelis decide what is in their best security interests. But on the issues of pluralism, where we as a Jewish people stand up and fight for the rights of Jews in, in, in England or in, in Japan to be able to go to synagogue, to be able to practice their, their religion, for us not to be able to 
uh, have a common understanding on, on religious respect and pluralism and difference in the Jewish state is, is probably the most significant issue between our two communities. And Hamad, could you agree? Has Israel made a mistake by disregarding the interests of American Jewry in pluralism? I don't think it lies there. I think it lies in the eyes of the American Jewry towards Israel. We are not anymore this small, very vulnerable country. We are strong, we are the strongest in the area, one of the largest, I don't know, army in the world, and they don't look at us as somebody who needs help. So it's another country, they have to relate to it, but they don't want, you know, and also the, the other thing is the occupation. Most of the young people, but on, they on the question, we'll get no, onto no, the question, no, we'll get onto the, the Palestinian, we will get onto the Palestinian no, it, question. No, it, it applies but on to the that. Question, but on the question of religious, no, hold on, the question of religious pluralism first. We see the Israeli government cancelling the Western Wall deal, which would have created an egalitarian plaza, taking steps against recognizing reform and conservative uh, reform and conservative conversions. Does the Israeli government not understand the extent to which do, that's they pushing do not. away? They're young dealing American with Jews. In, in, inter, internal internal uh, situation in Israel between the Orthodox, the ultra Orthodox, and the rest of the people of Israel. They don't care about the rest. They're only taking care of the ultra Orthodox and it affects also the American jury because they have to have a wider uh, uh, perspective. Which Ruthie they... Bloom, do they need a wider perspective? Look, I think that this whole issue, as Nahama said, is internal, is a political internal issue, but it, it has nothing to do with this government being right wing or not right wing. All Israeli governments have given power to the ultra orthodox because not they form coalition. Uh, wait, right now. The government is doing, making a delicate deal with them that is not only connected to the wall, and it is true that this may alienate some reformed Jews in America. However, the ir irony is that most uh, reform American Jews have never even stepped foot in Israel. They don't know anything about the actual controversy that's taking place at the wall. People who actually know what's going on. So let's on. bring in Mr. Foxman and, and, about and this And Mr. Foxman does understand well, the let's, complexity. I'm sure Mr. Foxman does understand. The argument here is the uh, American Jews are treading on eggshells here in Israel. There is a delicate balance of religion and state. And the Israeli government has to be responsive to its own population, including the ultra-Orthodox, and sensitive to their needs first before it can make accommodations to American Jewry. Would you not agree? Well, uh, no. Israel can't have it both ways. It cannot, on one right. hand, say... It is the state of, it is a Jewish state, and therefore it, it acts and speaks in the interests of Jews, especially when it comes to anti Semitism. It is the haven for the Jews. It can't, on one hand, speak that it cares about being a Jewish state and then ignore the issues of, of Jewish recognition, Jewish respect. Uh, Jewish behavior outside the state of Israel. The issue, as most of us know, is a dysfunction in the way the government operates. So, yeah, you can say it's right or it's left. Um, there is no real representative government. There's very little accountability, and, and that creates for the excesses. But, no, you can't have it both ways. You can't say you want to be a Jewish state, which Israel is, and then disregard the Jewishness of the diaspora. Okay, Abe Foxman, Director Emeritus of the Anti-Defamation League in the United States. Thank you very much for joining us from our New York studios. Journalist Ruthie Bloom, Nahama Dweck, thank, thank you, you very much for joining us. Yeah, Unfortunately, we're out of time. Mr. Foxman, thank you very much. We are going away for a very short break. When we come back, we're going to be looking at what's been making waves in social media in the Middle East. We're also going to be speaking with the author of a New York Times best-selling book about collusion between Russia and the campaign of US President Donald Trump. Much to discuss. We'll be back in just a minute. I'm Khaled Ben David. And I'm Nareen Ben. Join us on the rundown here in the heart of the Middle East for a candid conversation. A closer look at the stories born out of this region and driving changes all the way to Washington. Every Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Stories. Stories that touch your heart and open your eyes. Stories that take you on a journey and show you something you will never forget. 
Look through the lens and see what others see. High Definition, documentaries and discussions that connect us all. Join Lauren Izzo weeknights at 10.03 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. I-24 News. Fearless, timely, and always engaging. Every night, David Schuster brings the news from around the world to your front door. Watch Stateside, weeknights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Spin Room, social media guru Zizo Abu Hawa is here for our weekly edition of Meet the Feed. Zizo, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. What's been making waves online this week? Okay, first of all, I, want, I felt like bringing some closure to our viewers. A month ago, we talked about a live panel in Egypt that they were talking about sexual harassment, and we showed this video. Let's show this video again as a reminder. When a woman walks the streets and they're wearing ripped jeans and you can see their thighs and rear end, I say if girls walk like that, it's our national duty to harass them and rape them. Did he just say people have a duty to harass and rape women who are wearing uh, torn clothing? Exactly. He said it on national TV and it was widely condemned in Egypt. So a month later, now... Uh, he has been uh, <coughs> sentenced to three years in prison, prison and a fine of 20,000 Egyptian pounds, which is like $1,100. But the good thing is that he's going to jail for saying that on uh, national TV. The, nation, the, Egyptian, the Egyptian National Council said that those remarks are in violation of everything in the Egyptian constitution. So yeah, that's that. I hope that stops men from saying uh, incendiary comments uh, to incite violence against women. Did this women. provoke a lot of outrage on social media in the Arab world? Yeah, so much that uh, actually he got arrested for it and he went uh, to jail now. Very interesting. Okay, <laughs> what else do we have making the waves? Okay, now we're going to London where a British Muslim woman was trying to get something we always get, try to get as well, eating a Big Mac or some chicken nuggets in McDonald's. Uh, that's what happened to her when she entered. Let's watch. Why can I come into McDonald's? Because I'm wearing a hijab. I'm sorry, but like, can you please say it? Well, it's just a matter of taking it off. Then you go it's not just a matter of taking it off. I wear this for religious reasons, and I'm not ashamed of it. And I will stand in line, and I will get the food that I want, because this isn't okay. So yeah, <laughs> the video goes for more than a minute. Uh, the guys, the guy, some guy tells us that you cannot do that. And then when she gets in, after she puts inside, the manager tells her to stop being rude. Uh, he tells her she's being so rude. So she enters McDonald's wearing a hijab, which to remind our viewers, it's not, it's not a face covering. Yes. It's, just, it's just the head yeah, stuff yeah. that goes around the head. And the security guard tells her that she can't come into McDonald's. Yeah. What happens in the end? Does she buy her Big Mac? Uh, no, she got angry because the, also the manager told her she's being rude instead okay. of trying to understand the situation. And the video went viral and people got angry here. A couple of uh, reactions. Let's have a look at some of the reactions. Um, this guy who said that he does agrees with his hijab, but he, you cannot 
uh, but you know, abuse someone, the someone exactly, and UK. it's disgusting. And women and girls should never be forced to remove an article article of clothing. McDonald's UK issued a statement apologizing, saying that they do not have a policy to restrict, uh, that restricts anyone who wearing a hijab or any other religious attire, uh, and that the security guard, uh, guard that he wasn't a McDonald's employee, but from mm. a third party uh, um, a company, has been suspended, and uh, they hope more cases. Did McDonald's take a sufficient action here, acting against the? Uh, uh, I guess supposedly, yeah. That's the world. That everybody here now feels more free to act like a big it freely without any kind How of disappointing. <laughs> um, okay, what else do we have on social media, Zizan? Okay, last week we talked intensively about the reaction on social media and the Arab world about the, the decision of Donald Trump to uh, declare Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Okay. Uh, we're going to take about uh, now about a high profile case, uh, uh, including, and that includes an NBC channel presenter, she's a Jordanian, she's very known, she's called Olal Fares. Mm -hmm. uh, she tweeted this. She tweeted, where's the tweet? Okay, He's, she said basically that he didn't uh, um, choose randomly the time, he did it after being in Saudi Arabia, and she basically implied that it was uh, coordinated with Saudi Arabia. After Donald Trump was in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, exactly. Several months earlier. Exactly, and that, was, that the Saudi Arabia knew that this was going to happen, and that the Arab world is a hypocrite because they will, you know, condemn the thing at one night, it was a, it went last Wednesday, and on Thursday is going to be saying TGIT. Thank God it's uh, Thursday. What's well, special is, about Thursday? There's still one day of the working week left. No, no. In the Middle East, the weekend starts. It's Thursday. It's uh, Saturday. Right, so that's the so, yeah, exactly, it's Friday. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, so yeah, after the tweet was reported, um, it was reported she was fired and, uh, from banned from the NBC channel. And wh 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 why was she fired? I mean, what was so controversial? Because she was being disrespectful to the Saudi Arabian Kingdom, saying, you know. Uh, that they coordinated with Trump about Jerusalem and Saudi Arabia says no, we are against this decision. So she wasn't, wasn't fired as a journalist for making she a claim that she couldn't back up? <laughs> no, and, and she wasn't fired at all. She just she was trying to make a joke. She okay. actually tried the, to tweet that afterward that she's trying to tell people put your anger towards Trump and not toward me. We, feel, we have the fail, 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 same sentiment regarding the issue. Okay. Now we're going to Jordan. Uh, last week, an episode in a debate show called uh, Shabab Talk, uh, it was centered around women's rights in Jordan, Me Too also uh, waves in the, in the Middle East, and uh, this woman uh, was trying to say what happened to her when she was harassed, and let's watch. I'm speaking on my behalf. When I was sexually assaulted, I went to report it, and the policeman himself harassed me. In that case, where and to whom can I turn? Jordanian women are not harassed and do not act like you, and they definitely don't come to television shows. I'm asking you to respect her and let her talk and be respectful to all my guests. You're going to respect me or else you'll see how crazy I can get. Your show is stupid. So how do you say me too in Arabic? Anakaman. Anakaman. Yes. Okay, so what do we see in this clip here? He's a, par an, a former parliament member of the Jordanian parliament. This guy who uh, actually uh, offensively protested against her claims. Uh, she, at, he, the video is much, much longer. He kept saying that she's lying, that she's not probably not even Jordanian. And he demanded to see her Jordanian ID, and that women in Jordan, Jordan are never harassed. That's not a thing that happens in Jordan. I mean, is that, is that a claim that anyone in Jordan takes seriously? I hope not. <laughs> I, hopefully not. But uh, thankfully, the show's host, Ja'far Abdel Karim, called Okay, well, let's have, let's have a look at the next, uh, next thing. We have yeah. In the uh, we have so left. this week, Saudi Arabia lifted decades long ban uh, of cinemas. Finally, they're going to. Uh, we got into the 21st century and opening cinemas starting uh, next year, opening the first multiplex of 2018. Of course, they used to have cinemas before yeah, the yeah, Iranian yeah, revolution. Exactly, in 1979, exactly. And, um, well, most people welcome the news with excitement and anticipation. We're going to see some uh, reactions online. Uh, and the hashtag Saudi movie titles became viral. And okay. The end of thousands, yeah, it's been 84 years. <laughs> and then the hashtag called Saudi movie titles became very viral. Okay. viral with Give us some examples. Yeah, exactly. Let's uh, see some examples. Like, um, I know what you uh, ate last Ramadan and um, uh, the, 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 fa the fasting and the furious. Uh, this is the, I know, uh, what you ate last Ramadan, the fasting and the furious. This is a very quick bet. When Saudi Arabia has cinemas, is it going to be screening Wonder Woman? Oh. 
Probably not. Because she's a woman <laughs> or because she's Israeli? Both. I Probably guess. both. Okay, <laughs> Zizab Abelhawa, thank you very much for You're joining welcome. us. Thank We're you. going to be back after the break with the an interview with the author of the New York Times best-selling author on collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. Don't go away. We'll be back in just a minute. Zizab, thank you. Unflinching, opinionated. Weeknights, David Schuster and Shayna Estulin bring you analysis, interviews, and opinions that connect us to the Middle East and the world. Watch Crossroads weeknights starting at 6 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. I'm Tracy Alexander for I-24 News. Join us on Perspectives and get the whole picture as we break down the day's top stories from all angles. Perspectives, Sunday to Thursday at 5.05 p.m. Eastern. Politics, economics, business, and technology. Get the real news and the real insight about what's happening around the world. Michelle McCory breaks down the top stories of the day from the Middle East to the U.S. Weeknights beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern. I'm Emily Francis on I-24 News. Join us on Trending right here on the show that shines the light on the many amazing people doing positive work to inspire. This is the show about building bridges. Weekdays at 8 a.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. What you need to know, the news, fast and to the point, and the in-depth interviews that will keep you in your seat from the people that you trust. I-24 News presents The New Rundown, co-hosted by Nurit Ben and Kalev Ben David, every Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Back to the spin room. Deliberate collusion, unwitting collaboration, or a total witch hunt? The FBI is investigating Russia's interference in last year's U.S. election and the possible hand of the Trump campaign in helping a foreign power undermine American democracy. Spin Room is here with Creative Side, where we speak to authors worldwide about their groundbreaking work. Luke Harding is a foreign correspondent with The Guardian. He was once deported from Russia after the FSB broke into his apartment, and he's the author of the New York Times best-selling collusion, Secret Meetings, Dirty Money, and how Russia helped Donald Trump win. Luke, welcome to The Spin Room. Thank you. Uh, Luke, your book is titled Collusion. Now, that's a very strong allegation. How do you, as an individual journalist, reach such strong conclusions while the FBI is still building its own case? Well, uh, I think uh, there are several things we know about already. We know that Russia hacked the 2016 uh, American presidential election to help Donald Trump and to kind of chop the legs off Hillary Clinton. U.S. intelligence uh, agencies all agree about that. Um, and <clears throat> separately, we, we have a probe by a special counsel, Robert Mueller, who's already <clears throat> indicted four people from Trump's campaign, including most recently Michael Flynn, the former national security advisor who, who lied to the FBI. And what I set out in my book is a series of, of, of secret meetings involving Russian uh, emissaries, intermediaries with people from the Trump campaign. Uh, and I think the question I try and answer is, why is Donald Trump so nice about Vladimir Putin consistently um, when he's so rude about everybody else? So give us a spoiler alert then. Why is President Trump so flattering of uh, Vladimir Putin? Well, I mean, I think one of the things I explore in the book is, is the, the dossier, the famous dossier by Christopher Steele, the former British intelligence officer, um, and he says, uh, and I think this is broadly correct, that basically the Russians have got leverage uh, over Trump. They have a, a dossier of compromising material going back um, several decades, certainly to Trump's first visit to Moscow in 1987, when it was still the Soviet Union, um, and that um, uh, Putin can 
embarrass Trump if he wants to. Um, that there are allegations of sex, which which Trump denies in Moscow, um, and there are allegations of money, which I think Robert Mueller is actively investigating. And you put all this together, and that explains why Trump behaves the way he does. Okay. Well, but, I mean, before we get into the question of how much dirt the Russians might have, him, I want to focus on this question of collusion. I mean, how deep do you think the rot goes? How in on it was Donald Trump with Russian efforts to interfere with the election? I, I think it's impossible to say that he didn't know because, for example, we now know that a foreign policy aide, George Papadopoulos, indicted recently by Robert Mueller, was told in April 2016 uh, by, by a mysterious professor with connections in Moscow that, 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 that Russia was sitting on a, a mountain of hacked emails from the Democratic Party. This is before Hillary Clinton even knew there'd been uh, a breach and that there was a, a, a problem. And you, you just have to match what Trump said publicly at the time. He made this famous speech in Florida where he said, Russia, if you're listening, I hope you'll find the 30,000 emails that Hillary Clinton has deleted. He would argue that and, was a joke. Well, he would say that, but at the same time, we now know that his son, Donald Trump Jr., was was meeting with a with a lawyer from from Moscow called, called Natalia Veselnitska, and had been promised information from the Russian government, which would help the Trump campaign as part of Russia's effort to 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 push him, and would hurt Hillary Clinton. And now the White House said for months there were no meetings with Russians, and and now we know that practically everybody from Trump's orbit was meeting Russians very actively during this period. Okay, well, look, let's play devil's advocate. What do you think is the most compelling argument that Trump could make against the allegations you present in your book? What is his defense case? I think his best defense case, and it, it, it's not great, uh, is I was an idiot. Um, I, you know, I, th this was a chaotic campaign. We didn't know what was going on. And for sure, you know, the Russian ambassador pops up here and someone else from Moscow popped up there. But, but that doesn't mean that we colluded. It, you know, I mean, th that would be the kind of best defense. But it, it, it doesn't really work. And, and uh, we've seen, in addition to, to, to the, these meetings, which have kind of leaked out, we, we've seen a, a really quite concerted attempt by, by Trump, I would argue, to, to browbeat James Comey, the former FBI director, and then ultimately in May to fire him over what Trump admitted on TV was the Russia thing. Okay, well, uh, I mean, you, you, you mentioned earlier the Steele dossier. Mr. Steele himself says he's not sure 70, 90 percent of it he can be sure about. But if it's true that the Russians have dirt on Donald Trump, how concerned should Americans be that their president is compromised? Is this a national security risk to the United States? I, I mean, I, th I think <clears throat> I think the, the, the big picture is this, is that, is that Russia has, um, over a period of time, sought to kind of influence elections in the West, in, in democratic countries, actually in the same way the Soviet Union used to do during the Cold War. There's nothing new about this method, but it, it just so happened that, that <clears throat> last year, um, Russian operatives had a sort of kind of perfect storm. They had an America that was very bitterly divided with, with conservatives pitted against liberals um, and, and racial tensions and other factors as well. And they were able to exploit this both by using Facebook trolls and Twitter, but also, I think, by getting very, very close indeed to Donald Trump and his campaign. But can they exploit it now at this point? If the Russians have leverage over President Trump, I mean, would it be fair to say Donald Trump is a Russian agent or are we venturing into conspiracy theory territory here? I mean, I, I don't think we can say he's, he's an agent, but, but what the Steele document uh, says is that there was a kind of transactional arrangement, a deal, if you like, going back at least five years, where, where Trump and his people were supplying, for example, helpful information to the Kremlin on, on the activities of, of you know, Russian oligarchs in the United States, and, and, and Moscow was giving him political intelligence which would further his... His, his, his ambitions, and, and in the end, I think, help his, you know, rocket fuel for his kind of presidential run. And, and, how, might, with and, and how might Hillary. Donald Trump then help the Russians now if it's true that the Russians have dirt on him? Well, I, I mean, for one thing, what, what Trump says is quite remarkable. We had a meeting recently between Trump and Putin in Vietnam, and Trump said that, uh, that Vladimir had told him that, that, that Russia had nothing to do with election hacking, and he said, I believed him. I believed him. So he, he, he believes 
a, a former KGB guy who, by the way, learned about lying at spy school, about how you use it as a kind of operational trick. He believes him over over the, the, the intelligence assessments he's getting from the FBI, the CIA, and everyone else. And that's quite an astonishing statement. Okay, um, a, so uh, a, a drama that is sure to define the Trump presidency. Luke Harding, author of the New York Times bestselling uh, Collusion, thank you very much for joining us. And that brings us to the end of this section. We're going to be back in just a minute with Dan Raviv joining us from Washington, D.C. to discuss the latest on Capitol Hill. Don't go away. We'll be back in just a minute. Drama that only life can offer. Exploring society from within. Packed with untold truths and heart-wrenching dilemmas. The best documentaries, taking you on unforgettable journeys. Join Lauren Izzo weeknights at 10.03 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Fearless, timely, and always engaging. Every night, David Schuster brings the news from around the world to your front door. Watch Stateside. Weeknights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Welcome back to The Spin Room. Let's go now to Washington, D.C. for our weekly corner of Raviv Reveals with our senior Washington insider, Dan Raviv. Dan. Doug Jones delivered a major upset in Alabama last night. He became the first Democrat from Alabama to enter the Senate in a quarter of a century. He beat the scandal-plagued Roy Moore, of course, plagued by scandals uh, that he might have been a child molester, but he won by only 20,000 votes. How are the U.S. media explaining this electoral surprise? They're explaining that we're now in the age of Me Too, Elon, and that means the new era in which accusations by women that they've been sexually abused or molested are taken seriously. And so when those accusations surfaced against the Republican candidate, Roy Moore, uh, they were taken seriously by voters, certainly by the media. Moore himself, no. President Trump, not really. Uh, he, of course, was supporting the Republican Moore. Uh, uh, but I think that's really the issue that turned things around. Alabama is such a Republican state. Donald Trump won the state over Hillary Clinton last year with more than 60 percent of the votes. What a swing toward the Democrat, Doug Jones, who's lucky. He was against a scandalized Republican. And that means, of course, the Democratic Party is lucky uh, because now the Republicans, well, their majority in the United States Senate is whittled down out of 100 seats, just 51, not 52 it'll be harder for the Trump administration to get some key bills passed by Congress, Elon. I mean, how seriously does that affect the Trump agenda then? They still have a majority. How shaky is it? Well, let me uh, describe the current focus, which is the tax reform, basically a tax cut for American corporations and for many, many Americans, but not all. It's very complex. Americans can't quite figure it out. So we don't really know what public opinion is. But President Trump wants a win so badly, and so does the Republican leadership, that the Senate and the House each pass different versions of a tax cut. They have to get together and agree on one version. Uh, but then the Senate and the House both have to pass the one version. And what if they that takes place after the new Democrat, Doug Jones, is sworn in as a United States Senator. That's the beginning of January. Well, that's why the Republicans really want to get that tax bill through. And on this day, Wednesday, the Democrats said, why don't we slow down and think about the tax bill? So with the majority that razor thin, it definitely gives the Trump administration a lot of headaches. Well, then let's have a look at this election and break it down. As you say, this is a massive electoral swing from a state that has, uh, for as long as many people remember, always been red. But what was the reason? Because 20,000 votes isn't a lot. Was this over the child? Uh, molestation allegations, or was this some sort of backlash against President Trump, which should give the Democrats some hope for the future? 
Above all, I think it's that Roy Moore was a terrible candidate. In recent weeks, he hardly ever spoke in public or to reporters or even had rallies. He probably was afraid of more questions about how he treated young women, including teenage girls, when he was a younger man. At first, he agreed that sometimes he was dating teenage girls, and then later he said, I don't know any of these accusing women. And so he was a terrible candidate without credibility. I think if the Republicans put forward someone more conventional, probably the Republicans could win. And yes, even that Senate seat, because this only lasts for two years. It's the last two years of a previous Republican's term. There'll be another election in uh, 2019. The Republicans have high hopes they can get Alabama back. Maybe okay. they can. Well, Dan Raviv, let's take a look at the American angle on what's happening here in the Middle East. President Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Many U.S. analysts predicted, forewarned of some sort of violent explosion if he did that. It never came to pass. Has the American media understood just how dramatically this region has changed in recent years? A lot of columnists still feel that the Israeli-Palestinian dispute is the heart of the Middle East conflict. Uh, and to an extent, well, of course, it's important. And the Trump administration does believe that if it could work out a deal between the Israelis and Palestinians, that would be the core of something positive in which ISIS and al-Qaeda would be losers because the U.S. wants to pull Saudi Arabia and Gulf Arab moderates into some sort of overall peace deal. Okay, so it's possible that Trump's move on Jerusalem was aimed at that. It's also possible that he was mainly giving a favor to his Christian evangelical voters, also being nice to his Jewish son-in-law and his uh, Jewish daughter. Uh, and of course, the son-in-law, Jared Kushner, is also the chief Middle East mediator. Trump apparently feels that recognizing reality, that Jerusalem is Israel's capital, will be useful to the peace process. The White House keeps pointing out in private, the president did not say the Palestinians can't have part of Jerusalem. And so when the Organization of Islamic Countries demands that East Jerusalem is capital of Palestine, the Trump administration's answer would be, well, then have a peace deal. Work out a two-state solution if you want to, and maybe Jerusalem will be shared. Not every columnist in America understands those subtleties, Elon. Absolutely. A lead that was very much buried in the coverage, recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, but not any specific borders leaving open the possibility of some sort of deal to divide the city. Dan Raviv right. in Washington, D.C., thank you very much for joining us. And that brings us to the end of today's episode of Spin Room. I'm Elon Levy. It's been a pleasure to sit in this seat. Your regular host, Amy Kaufman, will be back tomorrow, same time, from the I-24 News team in Tel Aviv. Good night.